Welcome, Pierre. It's very nice to have you here. Thank you for giving time for this. Hello, everyone. Please tell us a bit about yourself first. So I'm Pierre Olivier. I am a young doctor. I just graduated a bit over a month ago now. I am a food web marine scientist. So I study the relationship between predators and prey in the sea. When you look at an ecosystem, you may think of the food chain that you might have heard from uh, high school, for instance, where herbivores feed on plants and carnivores feed on herbivores. But if you zoom out and you look at the ecosystem, you have multiple species of, of plants, of herbivores, of carnivores. So you have interconnected food chains that represent the food web. And that can be mapped as a social network, kind of, of organisms. And you can study the relationship between those, those species. I came to be a marine biologist by following, I think, a childhood dream. I come from the Champagne region in France, which is as far as possible from the sea. And I started my biological journey uh, at the University of Reims, my hometown. And then I did a master's in biological ethnography at the University of Pierre and Marie Curie in, uh, in Paris. And I went to do my master's thesis as part of Pierre and Marie Curie uh, University in Norway, in Tromsø, so in the far, far north. I was a PhD student at Hobo Academy in, uh, in Finland. And one of the studies that I think is, is really cool was about biological traits. Biological traits are all those characteristics that describe the biology, physiology, morphology of, of species. So what makes them unique and, and different. And when you think of the food web, that type of information tells you if an interaction is possible or not. So for instance, you have fish like dorad fish munch on coral. But to do so, it needs specific teeth. If you use canine teeth, so sharp teeth to cut flesh, it doesn't work. Like you're trying to break something really hard, really solid. So you need specialized teeth, molar teeth to, to be able to do that. And if I observe that some fish have those specific teeth, it can tell me that like a dorad, it's eating on corals or something that is quite hard to uh, to break down and that allows me to make assumption on other interactions that might not be observable or might have not been observed yet in, in nature. So that's uh, another cool topic that I've been investigating and maybe I will investigate that in the future. That's really cool, really interesting. And yeah, I can see the potential. And you also do scientific communication, right? Besides being a biologist and doing your research and your thesis and so on, I know that you have your main page, shine.science, and you also have another page, Ocean Fact, in which you share facts about marine biology and stuff. How did you build these two successful pages? Yeah, so I have two accounts that are actually relatively big on, on social media. I started with Ocean Facts. <laughs> I never intended to grow this big. I have 7K followers. When I was studying, I was observing a lot of organisms that I wanted to be able to identify later. So I was taking pictures and then I was describing their taxonomy and I was posting that on my, uh, my personal page thinking that, okay, it's just for me. I have all those cool pictures that were, to be honest, really bad pictures. I was taking pictures with my very old phone through the camera of a microscope. It's, it's terrible, but that's what I had at the time. And I was putting those sprinkles of, of information about those organisms. Before I knew it, I had 400, 500 followers uh, that came out of nowhere. People who were interested in in those species who were discovering organisms that they had never seen because when I was taking pictures from the microscope it was mainly small organisms such as copepods that are very tiny crustaceans but are among the most abundant organisms in the sea and it's it kind of connects with the second page that I have that is shine.science where I help others bring their best self out to uh, to talk about science. When I was doing Ocean Fact, if you look at my page, I at least at the beginning, I rarely shared anything about myself. I had a strong imposter syndrome and I could not get myself to put myself out there so that people identify me as a marine biologist. I thought if I do a mistake, my, my career is basically over before it even starts and that's what I wanted others to understand and others to go on this journey 
I was the expert on my own topic, so I needed to share it with the world. And it's something that really shaped me as a marine biologist, as a science communicator, and that has brought so many opportunities. Oh, so we are already in an ocean of information already, and a lot of that is misinformation. So I really, really value people like you that you say, you know, I know this is hard for me. This is, I, I feel a bit embarrassed or I don't li like to show myself on camera or, or all these things that people have, but that you, you still say, no, but what I'm doing is important, can help. And I am a fair expert like in this stuff that I'm sharing. And this is information people should have. So I think that's, that's really cool. And now can you give us some examples of topics or content that you have shared in your platform so that people can have like a sneak peek of it? Something I observe when we talk about climate change and so on is that we always take this fatalist uh, approach or at least pessimistic approach. And I believe it doesn't work. It's the worst communication possible. If you go talk to people and you tell them, well, the world is fucked, excuse me, <laughs> excuse me for my language, but the world is fucked, people give up. People give up. Why would you try to make a change if there is no hope? Instead, I wanted to make people curious about the sea, showing them things that they have never seen, help them understand how the ocean works, how nature works, by creating curiosity from those bite-sized information. They ask for more and they dig for more by themselves. One of my favorite topics, I think, has been mating strategies in nature and especially in the sea or feeding strategies. I think there are really cool uh, information there, especially if you go to the deep sea, you have the anglerfish, this fish that has a tiny lantern for attracting uh, prey and then catch them with this big mouth full of uh, long and, and sharp teeth. That fish in particular, because it lives in the deep sea and the deep sea is vast and most often empty compared to other regions of the, of the ocean or other depths in the ocean, it found a strategy to, to find a mate. The females of that species are up to two meters long, big females, and the males are just a few centimeters long. Their sole function as a male is to reproduce. That fish has found a strategy that because you won't come across females every day, if you find one, you want to stick to that one. And what better way than stick to, stick to that one than to fuse with it? Yeah, to fuse with it. So <laughs> you bite that female so hard that you reach the blood system and you start like a vampire uh, getting all the nutrients from, from the blood system of the female. And after a couple of, I don't know how long it takes, a couple of months, a couple of years, you see the male regressing to just a, a sack of sperm that is giving the sperm to the female and just getting the necessary nutrients it needs to, to survive. So you would find large females, two meters long, with a couple of, uh, of males attached to it, fused to, to its skin. And I think it, it's in this diversity and uh, unexpectedness in nature that I, I found beauty. Sometimes the, the stories we have covered are maybe a bit gross for some people, but you realize that nature always finds a way. We can talk about the Argonaut. The Argonaut looks like a, a Nautilus, looks like an ammonite, so it's a tiny cephalopod in a, in a white shell. And because there are so few individuals in the sea, it cannot just go around to, to find a mate. Instead, the male use an ectocotylus, which is one of the specialized tentacles that will detach itself, follow the pheromones of the female, and swim its own life to go and inseminate a female. So it's basically a detachable penis that will swim away to find a female. That's crazy. <laughs> Why in the hell would nature invent this? Yeah, it's it's really crazy and it's really cool at the same time. Like I, I am with you. Like I really like these these facts. I I don't know. I think it's it's insane how how this exists and I don't know. It's weird but cool. Human beings might be the most boring species. You have so many other species that develop ways to communicate, ways to find mates, ways to to get their food that 
that are so unique and so special and interesting that I don't know. I think it's our duty as scientists or as curious people, because you do not have to be a scientist to do science communication, to share that information with the rest of the world. And that's how you create curiosity, you create passion for a topic and how you can inspire uh, others. You know, it's all good with humans. We have a big brain, we make tools, but we don't have flying penises. So enough said. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny to see that there's a lot of species of different types of animals, also different orders and, and types of animals that they, uh, they have this pattern that there's a female form And then there's like a small little male that only works for reproduction and then kind of disappears. And it's kind of crazy to me. Like, it's, it's crazy to think. It kind of goes against the macho culture. Basically, <laughs> as male, we are useless. Our sole purpose is to procreate. It's sad, baby. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> But it's our sole function. And you see it in nature. The, the females, because they have to produce uh, the eggs, They have to produce eggs that are rich so that the the, uh, the offspring, the young, have the best chance to survive. They are most often, and I it's just because I'm not sure if it's 100% of the time or 90% of the time, most often they are much bigger than the male. I, I saw yesterday a video about those spiders. Uh, if you do not know, many species of spiders, the female is going to feed on the male after they mate. She is gonna get an extra snack so that she can produce the egg and and survive. Um, one species or several species find a strategy that once they mate, they basically jump away. So they have specialized legs so that they can spring away not to get eaten uh, by the female. It's kind of breaking the pattern that a male so prefers is to pick Uh, because it needs to survive. Okay, it's gonna go to another female and probably mate, but beyond the mating part, it doesn't, it still has a chance to survive. That's the, the argonaut that I was talking about earlier. Once this uh, detachable, detachable penis goes away, it doesn't regrow once. So it's gonna mate once for life. And after that, what's its purpose? You have many species of fish, they die soon after they mate. They bring the, the new cycle of life and, and they just die soon after, it's their strategy. And when you think about it, in nature, the female always had this more important role because that's the female who is gonna bring the next generation. You need the male to inseminate the female, but it's going to bring the next generation. In some species of bats, I don't know if all bats do that, the female can store the, the sperm of different males and then decide which one she's going to use to inseminate herself. So it's kind of like, okay, I'm going to use the male, but then I can live on my own and just like decide when I want to to have babies. And in the animal kingdom, it's often the female is going to decide when and what things are going to happen but in human societies the women have such a small importance or not as strong as they should be when you are a human living a human life in your human bubble uh, it's very easy sometimes to say this is how things work and and or even to use the argument nature is like this or this is how things are supposed to be and it's funny to compare with the other part of the animal kingdom and saying, okay, like, does this hold or not? And those were all the questions I have for you for today. Thank you so much, Pierre, for being here with us. It's really cool. Thanks for inviting me. It was a pleasure. And for those out there who are sharing science or who want to start, don't give up. It's rewarding, difficult, but rewarding. So just, just keep going and you'll find your crowd eventually. <laughs>